Like I let on at the end of my last review on Angel Cop, I mentioned that I was going to talk about an anime that was pretentiously bad, which probably made some people ask what the difference is between something pretentiously bad and something that is just plain awful. In my Angel Cop review, the main issue I had with its plot was that at times it begged the audience to take it seriously when the anime itself was just not smart enough for that. But where I would argue you can see the value in something like Angel Cop would be the fact that at the end of the day it was roughly speaking a well-produced anime and accomplished the goal of being a gory action flick. So at the end of the day, despite how bad the story is, I didn't mind it as much as I could have. Even though it did try to make some points about the moral greatness of justice and corruption, however, it just didn't do nearly enough to make the points as crystal clear to get them across to the audience. But I would argue that was a good thing. With Angel Cop, if you simply ignore how repugnant the main character is and how stupid its plot is, and you don't take it too seriously, you can at least have somewhat of a good time with it in the right mindset. A wind named Amnesia, on the other hand, is a totally different story. Unlike Angel Cop, which had plenty of moments that made me laugh at the anime and have a good time, A Wind Named Amnesia does not offer any such comforts. If you were to simply look at the anime on the outside looking in, you would at least come away with it thinking it's a simple action road trip across America. But when you really stop to think about the story it's trying to tell and its messaging along with it, it just does nothing but infuriate me. And the thing that bums me out is that the original light novel the anime was adapted from was written by Hideyuki Kikuchi, perhaps one of the most influential writers in the world of anime and manga. Despite the fact that the man's works mostly exist in the realm of the written word, his works have been hugely influential when it comes to manga and anime. In fact, multiple stories he wrote became the basis for many an old taku classic, such as Wicked City, Demon City Shinjuku, Dark Side Blues, and Vampire Hunter D. Yeah, that Vampire Hunter D. Before anyone mentions it, I have not read the light novel this was based on, as when it comes to translating Japanese into English, it can yield unsatisfactory results considering how the Japanese language works when it comes to the spoken and written word, with so many words having multiple meanings, and from what I can tell, reviews seem to be either mixed or positive, with the caveat that the English translation is suspect at best. So with this review, I won't be judging the anime in the context of its source material, but rather the adaptation itself. And I'll say this, it didn't have to be bad. I don't know if the anime came out the way it did because of the source material or because it was the result of screenplay writers adapting it for a visual medium, but either way, I don't like this anime at all. But why don't I like it? And why do I use the word pretentious when I describe it? Well, first I would like to address the word pretentious as it is a word that at times is used a little too liberally to describe any piece of media that tries to inject some sort of thoughtful use of themes or messaging in their story. I'm not saying when writers who use their plot and story as a way to drive a message across to the viewer is, to me, considered pretentious in any way. For example, in my Ninja Scroll review, I used the example of Hideo Kojima and Death Stranding as an example of a piece of media being bad because of how pretentious the game's director is due to how smart he thinks he's being by using a medium like video games to craft a thoughtful message in a very disingenuous way. If you think throwing a bunch of smart sounding buzzwords that the audience has no context for like an ape throwing its shit at a wall and hoping it sticks and writing scenes in such a way that calls attention to its own symbolism by having a character say, if that's not symbolic, I don't know what is. That is fucking pretentious. And the hell of it is, he's done it better before. Like Metal Gear Solid. Yeah, a game that was at least over $20 million cheaper with level design work done with Legos was not only a better game, but also had a message and theme that wasn't god-awful and eye-roll inducing. Oh sure, the message at the end of the day did just come down to murder nuclear missiles bad, okay? 
but because the writing was so tight and the headroom they had on development was so minimal, it forced the team to narrow down on their vision for what they wanted the project to be and make something as special that they could with as little resources as they had. And in the end, was better for it. Point is, there is a way to write a story with a message without being completely pretentious while not having a huge budget and still remain a good piece of entertainment. And then there's this. Well, let's just jump right into it. This is a wind named Amnesia. Set in America in the futuristic year of... Uh, 1990X. Oh, come on with this bullshit. What is this, Mega Man? Okay, to be fair, this was very common in the 80s and the 90s, as this was still the century where people thought we would have hoverboards and flying cars by the year 2000. What a terrible prediction that was. Stories that were set years in the future generally had a bad habit of making terrible predictions by naming the specific year certain technological advancements would take place. Like how in the original Star Trek and the Eugenics Wars novel, they made a plot point about World War III taking place in 1996, which was the result of genetically engineered super soldiers like Khan. Naming the specific year just serves to make the time your story was written look more dated as time goes on, which is why in later cuts of the anime they just gave the year of 1990X instead of 1999, like in the earlier cuts of the anime. But even naming the specific decade and century doesn't work either, as even in the year 2021, we would have thought we would have machines that make food out of thin air and blowjob robots that run on dreams. Yet that shit hasn't happened either, so it's no wonder that most writers avoid naming a specific millennium, century, decade, or even year, because by now, we know better. Well, in any case, we can see that the anime takes place in a post-apocalypse of some sort, with human beings acting in a feral and primal manner, with Bandana Man driving around San Francisco in a jeep, doing something, only to run into Ed 209 gunning down the ferals, which seems to upset Bandana Man. Hit the turret. Aim for the turret. That's the nerve center. Hmm. A disembodied voice tells Bandana Man exactly where his fuck me now point is to shoot Ed. Wanna guess how many bullets it takes to take it down? One fucking shot. What is Ed 209 made of? Toilet paper? I don't care what pistol he's using, which from my knowledge looks like he's carrying a 1911 which is chambered in 45 ACP, which is nowhere near powerful enough to destroy a big robot in one shot. This ain't Contra, my dude. Also, how the fuck did he make that shot anyway? What, because he's in bullet time like he's Max Payne? Well, in any case, the disembodied voice reveals herself to our hero. Well done. Hey. You can talk? How come you can speak? That was brave. Aw, shucks. Thanks, lady. Wait, that doesn't answer my question at all. To fight a robot, armed only with a magnum. Honey, unless you're talking about what's in his pants, that's not a magnum he's using. If it is, I'm eating my beard. Anyway, Silverhair here decides to give some background on the robot, which she knows for some reason. What was it? A guardian. A decade ago, violent riots became increasingly frequent here in San Francisco, and the authorities developed these machines to maintain law and order. This particular guardian must have been on patrol when the wind struck. The pilot will have forgotten how to open his cockpit or operate his ejector. But even after he died slowly, horribly of starvation or lack of oxygen, the computer which controlled his machine and which had been programmed to detain or destroy 
continued doing just that. The guardian of an authority that had long ceased to exist. Wait a minute. So in 1990X, some company made manned robots that has an onboard computer capable of piloting itself without the need for a pilot. What sense does that make? That would be like the company in stealth that made the AI control fighter planes, designed them to also require a pilot in order to run. Which makes no sense. Hell, at least in Macross Plus, the YF-21 required a pilot to connect his brain to the plane for it to work. This is just nonsense. But believe me, this is the least of this anime's problems. In any case, Silverhair's name is Sophia. As for Bandana Man? Tell me your story. What's your name? Of course, I didn't know what my name was. So Johnny called me Wateroo. Whoa, wait, 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 wait. Wataru? Okay, I know he's supposed to be saying Wataru, but man, this is just peak we can't pronounce Japanese for shit assery. But to be fair, this was the 90s after all. Let's not pretend that all you fighting game nerds didn't think Ryu's name was pronounced Ryu, because we all made that mistake. It's at this point that Sophia asks Rue about his backstory and why he ended up traveling America in a jeep. And this is where the plot does get fascinating. Long story short, the reason for the apocalypse was due to a wind that made everyone have amnesia so bad that it reduced humanity to nothing more than their primal instincts. So much so that people forgot how to pilot planes or drive cars to simply not knowing how to cook or what food is edible or not as Rue tried to eat flowers that are inedible and doesn't even understand the concept of what a mirror is. It is intriguing as it sets the rules of what happened to the world and why things are the way they are. Too bad it screws it up. We'll get to that. Rue runs into what looks like a military base where he runs into a psychic trying to kill a kid in a wheelchair, to which Rue tries to save him. Which is inconsistent, as it was established earlier, that the wind caused people to fight over a loaf of bread and even Wataru, not being able to understand human emotion like when he takes the sausages from the kids, which causes them to cry. But for some reason, he feels the need to save a disabled kid from a psychic. I understand that this could just be chalked up to Rue not understanding his own actions or why he's doing what he's doing considering he's just running on pure instinct. It just breaks the rules though that were already established not even a few minutes earlier. This is where keeping things more vague and what the wind did and didn't do would have allowed for the writing to play a little bit more fast and loose with its own rules and oh boy. It gets dumber. Well, Johnny kills the psychic and befriends Rue, which for some reason Johnny managed to not be affected by the wind, which he reveals to Rue is because he had a computer implanted into his brain, which that makes even less sense as the anime progresses. You'll see what I mean. And it's because of Johnny through the use of a complex machine which injects knowledge into Rue's brain that he's able to behave like a normal civilized human being again. As for the name... You don't remember your name, do you? No, I don't. Let's think of what to call you. I suppose a name that describes the role you'll play in the world which the winds left us. A name like Wataru. Sounds pretty odd. It's a Japanese word that means traveler, which is what you'll be. Because your role will be to travel all over the world, helping men to relearn what they've forgotten. Well, that didn't sound forced at all. Look, I get that the story was written by a Japanese man, but considering the setting, which is set in America, unless Rue is actually Japanese, it makes absolutely no sense, as he's only given that name for the symbolic meaning to his role. And what makes it all the worse is that he has to spell it out to us like we're idiots. Now, to be fair, I understand that the context is that he's explaining the meaning of the name to Wataru because he asked Johnny what it meant, because he has the knowledge of a five-year-old and Johnny is teaching him things, so I get that, but the only reason I could see this being written into the script is to explain this to us, the viewer. 
And it does nothing but to make us feel stupid like we should have known that. Never mind that the anime is set in America, where most people's names aren't Japanese, especially for the time this anime was released. It's just contrived and forced symbolism. And I'm only 17 minutes in. You know what happened when the wind blew over the earth? Everything that had been learned, everything men had achieved in the time since progressing from the apes, was forgotten. Their memories were wiped clean. They forgot everything they'd created, the music, the painting, the science, even their families, their names. They forgot how to use their machines and what they were for. All these things were blown away. We know that. The question is not what happened, but what made it happen. For instance, a military experiment which misfired? Perhaps we'll never know. But whoever was behind it, it's without doubt the biggest catastrophe that's ever been seen in the world. It could have been unleashed by men who had become so convinced of their great wisdom it never occurred to them their inventions were out of control. Or perhaps beings from another world. Patience! 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 In any case, after an unspecified amount of time in which Johnny teaches Rue everything he needs to know, and giving him a goal which is basically the plot for the anime, that being to travel to every major city in America in the hopes of spreading his knowledge to the now feral and primal human remains, Johnny unfortunately passes away due to some illness. And to be honest, it is kind of sad, but with a goal now in mind, Rue heads out on his journey, cutting back to the present. Sophia now coming along for the ride. The reason? Hey, I never got around to asking where you're heading. New York. Right away. Think you'll make it in one piece? Yes, but I know I'd have a better chance with you along. So she's going to New York from San Francisco. And the next stop on their journey is Los Angeles. I could bitch about how retarded that is geographically. But fuck it, this anime has way more problems than that. The new pair of Rue and Sophia travel to LA. It's eerie being in this huge city that doesn't seem to have any people in it. Things may have gotten so tough that everybody ran away. Oh, you mean like the real Los Angeles? In any case, Rue sees a woman being chased by a mob of ferals. <laughs> Wait. But the girl! Be careful. You may not realize what's going on with these people or exactly why they're after her. They've had to make up new rules because they found the old ones are no use to them any longer. Hun, I understand the sentiment you are trying to convey and all, but they all have the capacity of a two-year-old. What makes you think they even know what rules are? Well, Big Lenny comes in to save her, only to get shot by- Okay, what the fuck? How would the feral guy with the gun even know how to use it? Or even know what a gun is? This is one of the things that irritates me the most about this anime. It plays so fast and loose with its own rules that it established about the wind. One moment the human race forgets how to do simple tasks like how to use complex machinery, to even not knowing what a mirror is, to all of a sudden ferals knowing how to use a gun. I can understand the idea of that the feral humans that have forgotten everything but their primal instincts would at least figure some things out on their own over time, but it doesn't seem like it's been more than at least a year or two since Rue's flashback. So why would this guy even know how to use a gun? Whatever, Rue shoots at the ferals and scares them off. Rue tries to communicate with them, but you know, they're as dumb as a mailbox, but Sophia manages to calm them down. Then this happens. I've been able to communicate with them to some extent. Her name is Sue, he's called Little John. Their people had chosen her to be the bride of their god. Tomorrow is to have been the day of her marriage. Okay. I don't know what's more confusing. That the two ferals even know their names? Or that Sophia somehow managed to communicate to them somehow, even though they shouldn't even know how to communicate other than use guttural noises and grunts like they're cavemen. And even that makes no sense as the wind made them forget 
everything. So how would they even know what their names are? I'm assuming the implication is that she read their minds, but that makes no sense, as was established earlier that they forgot everything due to the wind. Communicating with these feral idiots, I would imagine would look more like this. Doing. In any case, Sophia finds out the reason Sue was being chased was because she was going to be the bride to their god. What? So humanity loses all memory to the point that they all have the mental capacity of wild animals, but they understand the concept of a god. <laughs> And apparently, how they marry brides to their god is by sacrificing them. Poor kid. No wonder she's got nightmares. But does their god really exist? Perhaps. What's important for you to remember is that the men who were chasing her believe it does. So to those men sacrificing her to appease him is natural. It's disgusting! Sacrifices were offered to the gods for thousands of years after man first looked up and recognized unknowable forces ruling him. In terms of his history on Earth, the custom was stopped only the blink of an eye ago. And now that the wind has blown away the old restraints, the old certainties, it's not surprising he's returned to it. And you, huh? are you so certain of your own values that you're prepared to impose them unthinkingly on others? To choose their way of life for them? To tell them what is good and what is bad? Demanding obedience by force if necessary. Okay. Anime, I understand the angle you were going for, but... Fuck you. Seriously, are you really trying to go for the how dare you impose your will on others angle? Look, I get what Hideyuki Kikuchi was going for. The idea that sometimes it's better to let nature take its course and leave things be. And maybe if this was the situation where Rue misunderstood what was actually going on and that there was some sort of reasonable explanation for why the Ferals were hunting her and Lenny down, that could have worked. But that's not what this is. We're literally talking about a post-apocalyptic group of feral humans with the mental capacity of chimpanzees trying to sacrifice a woman on the altar to their god. The room for nuance is pretty fucking thin. I mean, human beings outside the Aztec society didn't think it was cool for villagers to be sacrificed to Quetzalcoatl. So why is it bad in Sophia's eyes to think it's shitty for Rue to help out a woman from having her agency be stripped away from her to be sacrificed to a quote-unquote god? Are you starting to see what I mean when I call this anime pretentious? It brings up concepts that are pretty intriguing, only to fall on their face due to the fact that the scenarios that are used to equate these concepts to are just not even close to being equitable in any reasonable manner, that do nothing but serve to make the writer seem stupid and not have a good grasp on the messages he's trying to convey to the viewer, and makes Sophia look like a dumb cunt that thinks she's way smarter than she actually is. Hell, even Rue points out how stupid her pretentious bullshit is, making the point that Sue has the right to live her own life and choose whether she is sacrificed to a god or not. And she agrees. Oh, and the best part is, and you're not gonna believe this, their god is a giant backhoe. I'm dead serious. The god that she was going to be sacrificed to is a giant machine with lasers, hoes, and the ability to demolish buildings like their Jenga blocks. So yeah, Sophia, I know you think you're smart and all, but fuck you. Fuck you and the cornflakes rattling around in your head that you call a brain. And believe it or not, it gets stupider because the person piloting the backhoe is a shaman, which I just, do I really need to explain why this is dumb and contradicts everything about the wind that we know about at this point? Block consistency, what's that? Long story short, Sue ends up being killed by a laser beam, which pisses off Rue, raising his gun at the backhoe to stop it. Wanna guess how many bullets it takes?
One shot. That is impossible. I don't care who you are. That shot isn't feasible with that fucking gun. Nobody who's worth their salt and firearms would be able to accomplish that feat. Hell, not even gun Jesus. The bullet drop, velocity, windage, hell, even the impact of the bullet on the glass in no way would make that shot possible. The best part of this, though, is not only that he does manage to do this in one shot, it's the fact that he domes the shaman, which causes the backhoe to explode like it's the Wily Castle. Golgo 13, kiss my ass. Deadeye, right here, buddy. Johnny would be spinning in his grave because he should have given him a more fitting name because he's the pistol variant of Tenchi Masaki. With all that out of the way before leaving, Rue gives Lenny a spas 12, which he had on him, I guess, anointing him the new sheriff of the Ferals of LA. Rue and Sophia leaving to head out to the next destination. Only to... Wait, what the fuck? Ed 209 is still alive? How? We can't stay here any longer, Wataru. The Guardian you confronted has a computerized self-repair program. It won't be long before it resumes its search and destroy mission against you. Well, that's convenient bullshit. Ed 209 does its best to kill them both, but Rue manages to blow up Ed 209. However, the both of them falling into a canyon fading to black. You would think that would be the end of them, but no, as Rue wakes up in a hospital when a doctor comes in who can talk. Sophia comes into the room to explain to Rue where they are. Listen, how come he treated me and how come he can talk? Haven't people in this part of the country lost their memories? The U.S. government designed and built this eternal city at the beginning of the 21st century. The beauty of it is that it's completely self-contained with its own hospital, university, park, suburbs, and services. The farms in the city limits are big enough to supply all the food that's required. The whole system's controlled by supercomputer. The guardians are programmed so they cannot enter. Now, I won't lie here. This part of the anime is actually pretty decent. Yeah, it has its issues, but I like the setup for this part of this anime. Rue and Sophia are brought to a city that is self-sustaining, that has what seems like normal people, except for the fact that there seems to be no one else except for Miss Lisa and Mr. Simpson. And something is off with them as Rue notices that they both change into different roles constantly, going from a doctor, a nurse, a patient, a couple, and even the mayor and an assistant of the mayor. Leading to Rue and Sophia being propositioned by the mayor to live in the Eternal City. But of course, Rue asks what the deal is with the city and with them playing multiple roles. And unfortunately, this is where the setup falls apart. The answer isn't entirely clear even to me, but the wind affected us as well as you outside. It affected not only the people living here in the Eternal City, but also the supercomputer which manages our affairs. It didn't forget, but it became very confused. Before it managed to repair itself, many lives were lost. The computer had been programmed to put the protection of the city above all else. In its damaged state, it mistook the unfamiliar violence of the people as that of enemies and killed many of them. The rest ran away. <sighs> you see, this is why I wish the rules of the wind wasn't established and was kept more vague. Because if it was, stupid contradictions like this wouldn't be so glaring. On its own, this story idea could have worked as it feels like something out of the Twilight Zone. The only failing being that this part of the anime is connected to what came before it. So the whole plot point about the computer being affected by the wind and mistaking the amnesiac citizens for the enemy only to be killed off, which is why Lisa and Simpson are the only two left alive and were given the memories of all the citizens by the computer, which kind of makes no sense, runs into direct contradiction with Johnny. You know, the kid with the computer in his head? If the wind could affect a huge computer that runs a city, 
Why did it not affect the computer in Johnny's head? It makes no sense and ruins an otherwise good section of the anime as the way it ends is actually kind of sad. As Rue tries to convince Lisa and Simpson to come with them to see the outside world, initially convincing Lisa to come, but Lisa changes her mind to stay in the city with Mr. Simpson, choosing to live a comfortable lie instead of seeing the outside world. The peace and security she has here were too strong to resist. But the important thing is that she chose to stay. It wasn't the computer. She chose for herself. That's a huge step forward. Let's go. <laughs> Gee, geez. No need to get attached, Sophia. It's a shame. As this part of the anime is a really good story beat that is ultimately ruined by the main plot's soul-defining plot point. The Wind of Amnesia. Which is just a shame, but this, this is nothing to what comes next. Back on the road, Rue and Sophia make it to Las Vegas. <sighs> Las Vegas, a city men built in the barren desert to feed their equally barren greed. The wind blew and this place became a dead monument to futile pleasure. Listen. Sophia, I know your version of events sound better to make you sound deep. In reality, Las Vegas was originally founded as a fort to house traveling caravans of Mormons and traders passing through. But what do I know? I'm just a nerd dork. Welp, here it is. This is the moment I absolutely loathe. A moment so infuriating that it pissed me off to no end. If you want to have it not spoiled for you, skip to here for my conclusion, but I warn you now, the payoff isn't worth it. So here it is. So, why was the wind sent through the earth, Sophia? Wataru, there's something I should tell you, assuming you haven't guessed already. Yeah? We caused the wind and let it blow over the earth. It was no accident. It was done deliberately. Mm -hmm. Yes. I represent the power of a distant planet. We have kept watch on your world since life first appeared on it. The first creatures that crawled out of the water, the dinosaurs that ruled for so many centuries, and finally the coming of man. Till very recently, you were not thought to be a danger to us, but when you broke free of the Earth's gravity, we started to be afraid of your leader's aggressiveness. That they'd attack? We weren't sure, but we couldn't take the risk. So you sent the wind? Yes. Though since we met, I think it was a bit hard. <laughs> well, that's pretty bad. But it gets worse. There was a second reason beside the need to defend ourselves, and that was done for your own good. Men have always said what they desire most is happiness, and yet their actions seem to lead in the opposite way. By removing the baggage of their memories, we gave them the chance to make a new beginning. A beginning that might lead them towards the goal they claim to want. Un-fucking real. For our own good, huh? It was as if we were all babies again, but babies with the strength of grown men and women. And soon, people started to feel hunger. Food became the only necessity, and people fought for it like savages. In my town, at least, there was still plenty for all, but that had been forgotten. The old and the weak were swept aside without mercy. Parents abandoned their children, not even knowing they were theirs. Yeah, thanks for that one, you fucking cunt. All the dead bodies, children abandoned by their parents left to die a lonely and sad death, and the possibility that due to her people's actions, the human race very well may go extinct. And for what? Because her race was afraid that Earth would kill them all? Why? 
You guys are not only more advanced than the human race considering the fact that you literally have the history eraser button at your fingertips, which you use on the human race preemptively to prevent something that you would have no idea would even happen or not. Which is just horseshit, as even Rue pointed out that not all human progress was done for bad reasons earlier in the anime. And you cut him off. Before the wind, men must have been curious about all kinds of things they've got no time for now. But I'm curious and I want to learn. Yes, it's because they were curious that people progressed. All progress couldn't have been bad. Quiet. What? What's the matter? We're being followed. In fact, the thing that really gets me is how she seemingly doesn't understand that it, it's just as, if not more fucked up to preemptively attack an entire population just because there were a few assholes that may have done something out of fear, skipping the whole diplomacy step entirely. Which would be one thing if you guys looked like xenomorphs, but you look just like and have similar biologies to human beings. So what was there to be afraid of? Were you a bit shy? Were you a bit embarrassed and thought you might get made fun of for living in your flying disco ball? You know, this kind of reminds me of the themes explored in movies like Minority Report with the Precogs, asking the question of, is it justified to arrest people for crimes that the cops prevented them from doing in the first place because they knew it would happen? Except this is worse, as not only did her race have no real justification for what they did out of fear when the human race didn't even know of their existence, yet she has the gall to say that sending humanity back to the fucking Stone Age was for their own good? Oh sure, there are some bad apples that may have done what she and her people feared, but to condemn the entirety of humanity, ruining the lives of billions of otherwise normal people on the vein to stop the bad humans from doing something they may or may not have done? All this bullshit just to have a humanity bad message? That is fucking pretentious. And for some reason, Rue takes it pretty well, all things considered. Oh, the revelation that Sophia and her people are the reason for the potential extinction of humanity does make him feel a certain way at first, but he just seems to let it go. What's wrong? Nothing. I'm fine. Wanna well, know why I think he got over it pretty quickly? Probably because he wants to get that alien pussy. No, I'm serious, because later on, not only do they almost kiss before being cock-blocked by Ed 209, they do in fact make it to New York, dropping off Sophia before taking care of business with Ed 209, Rue successfully taking care of Ed, though he takes a bullet seemingly falling to his death again. When this shit happens. I learned from you as well, but now we will learn something new together. What in the fuck is going on? Seriously, where are they? In the fucking negative zone? I'm assuming they're in a church with the organ music and the statue of the Virgin Mary holding baby Jesus. But we have no other context for that. Though in all honesty, I wouldn't be surprised if the meaning of the statue in the background, while the two are bumping uglies, is to symbolize that the child that would result between an alien and a human would become the Messiah. Oh, go fuck yourself, anime. You are not that smart. And that's it. Sophia and Rue part ways, Sophia flying home to the magic disco ball in the sky, and Rue takes off to wander the wasteland. The end. I have never felt so conflicted with an anime that has such good ideas for a premise that pisses it all away in the service of a shitty enforced message.
When I said this anime didn't have to be bad, I do mean that, as there are a good amount of ideas here that could have made for a good story. Hell, even the reveal near the end didn't need to be as insulting or as infuriating as it was, as there were plenty of moments that conveyed that Sophia was aware that maybe her and her people were wrong for what they did. But at the end of the day, execution matters. And it was executed poorly. My God, that was awful. Worst thing I've ever seen, not by a long shot, insulting? Abso-fucking-lutely. This anime is so up its own ass that if it was a person, it would look like the end result of when Dr. Weird's ass ate himself. My ass has finally decided to eat my hand! It hungers for more! I can tolerate bad pieces of media. In fact, one of my favorite films is objectively terrible. <laughs> but... But at the very least, it didn't try to be something it was not. Here? This anime started as a thoughtful piece of storytelling and ended up an insulting, stupid, and above all, one of the most pretentious pieces of fucking shit that I have ever seen. Good fucking riddance. Let's cleanse the palate. Next time, we are going to take a look at a classic that many people probably may or may have not seen. In fact, it was one of Mamoru Oshii's first major works in the field of anime. And I couldn't think of a better anime to look at. Till next time. Okay.